This is Cahasavine Workhouse. Long abandoned, it is now a peaceful place. It's hard to believe that it once held many hundreds of people in terrible conditions. Workhouses were the main form of providing poor relief, now called welfare, in Ireland from the 1840s to the end of the 19th century. This meant that they were at the centre of the response to the Irish famine. Much has been written about the Irish famine. This is understandable since it is one of the most traumatic events in modern Irish history. It is also a complex topic that has to be treated sensitively and respectfully. Unfortunately, too often it is reduced to a political football. Many scream genocide, and while the British government at the time carry much blame, as they were ideologically blind and deaf to the famine, this oversimplifies a very complex event. Others grossly inflate the numbers who died or emigrated, while others make frankly absurd political statements. The very right-wing von Mises Institute released a video which blamed the famine on too much government interference and not enough free market. It was after this that I decided to make this video. It is impossible to understand the famine without understanding the workhouse. Workhouses were built in Ireland following the 1838 Poor Law, a copy of the 1834 English Poor Law. This was ideologically driven, as can be seen in the drafting of the law. Initially, a report was commissioned to investigate the relief of poverty in Ireland. However, when this report rejected the extension of the English Poor Law to Ireland, it was binned, and another one rapidly produced, and then the 1838 Poor Law passed. It was based on ideas which are still very prevalent, what can be called anti-welfare, blaming the poor for their poverty, rejecting public or state intervention in the economy and extolling the free market. Sound familiar? The law divided Ireland into 130 poor law unions, each of which had a workhouse. All poverty relief had to take place inside the workhouse, as outdoor relief was banned. Moreover, what was provided inside the workhouse was based on the principle of less eligibility. In other words, it had to be worse than the worst conditions outside the workhouse. The workhouse was thus designed to be a horrendous place. Furthermore, it had to be paid for locally. A rate was levied by each union, paid for by those in the area. This had obvious disadvantages for those living in poor unions. The ideology of the workhouse divided the poor into deserving and undeserving. The latter were said to be poor because of their own faults and were not entitled to any relief. Even the deserving poor were treated harshly, and this is where the principle of less eligibility came into play. Workhouses were intentionally a place of last resort. Families were divided when they enter. Rations inside were bad. Strict rules were enforced with many punishment, and was compulsory labour in many. The poor law, the workhouse and the ultra-market ideology it was based on were completely unsuited to a country with massive poverty such as Ireland. The Irish population had risen considerably in the first half of the 19th century. Yet this rested dangerously on the potato. For a large part of the population, the potato was the main food source. Other crops, such as oats and barley, which grew well in Ireland and traditionally formed part of the Irish diet, were transformed into cash crops. This meant that they were beyond the reach of the poorest cottier class, even in good times. Although the landholding system in pre-famine Ireland is usually described in the form of a neat pyramid, with the big and mostly absentee landlords on the top, followed by various middle-ranking farmers, and then the landless cottier class at the bottom, the picture was more complex. As Kevin Whelan shows, in addition to these capitalistic forms of land use, older, pre-capitalist forms also existed. The Rundale or Clock-On system, where land holding was often communal. Moreover, rights to land were often based on a more abstract and complex concept. The Kuriev, or share, involving environmental constraints, kinship and lease obligations. Moreover, the growth in the Irish population was especially strong in the poorest Atlantic coastal and upland or bog areas. In other words, in the poorest part of Ireland, a new complex and modern social structure emerged, more and more dependent on the potato. Meanwhile, tillage, which required considerable labour, declined in importance, 
replaced by livestock. As a result, employment declined, bringing down wages. In the middle of this precarious situation, the government in London, enthralled to market ideology and to anti-Catholic, anti-Irish and anti-poor prejudice, insisted on implementing the poor law on the workhouse system in Ireland, setting the stage for the disaster. In the second half of 1845, potato blight appeared in Ireland. It hit the potato harvest hard, reducing it by at least a third. This was not the first failure of the potato crop or famine in Ireland. As can be imagined, these occurred with considerable frequency. At first, the British government responded in what can be called the usual way. Maize, called Indian corn or meal, was purchased. In March 1846, this began to be sold at a cheap rate in order to keep food prices down. Relief committees were set up to administer it. In Ivra, these were established in Valencia, Carsevin, Nakane, Kilogdlan and Kinmare. There were also some public works, while private charity also played a role, notably the Quakers. This meant that the impact of the blight in 1845 appeared to have been weathered. In Ivra, there were no recorded deaths from hunger. However, two things transformed a period of hardship into the Great Famine. First, the potato crop failed again in 1846. This time it was almost completely lost. In 1847 and 1848, the potato crop also suffered tremendous losses again. Second, there was a change in government. In the summer of 1846, Lord John Russell and the Liberal Party came to power. They strongly supported laissez-faire, or letting the free market operate freely, while many in the government thought the Irish were to blame for their misfortunes, due to their dependence on the potato, their backwardness, and, indeed, landlordism. Several were evangelicals, while providentialism, or belief that the famine was the work of God, seems to have been common. In addition, whatever its cause, the famine was seen by many as a chance to modernise Ireland, or more accurately, to make it fully part of the modern market-based system. While accusations of British genocide are inaccurate, the British government has to bear much of the blame for the famine. Radical belief in the market and the insistence on using it to guide policy to relieve famine had horrendous results, to say the least. Moreover, this contemptuous view of the poor was not confined to the Irish notwithstanding strong anti-Irish prejudice among many of the British elite. Blind worship of the market would also have a heavy impact on the poor and the emerging working class in Britain. Indeed, by the time of the Boer War, it was discovered that 20% or more of recruits were physically incapable of serving the army, essentially due to poverty. In 1846, as the famine worsened dramatically, the government was forced to change its policy. Purchasing maize was abandoned. Instead, this was to be left to the market. As was believed, this was the best way of getting food to the country. However, in a time of shortage, food prices rocketed. A clear case of market failure. Public works were now made the primary source of famine relief, meaning that the starving poor were made to work to receive money to buy food. However, as food prices shot up, the wages received were too small to survive on. Moreover, many doing the work were undernourished, making it hard for them to do the hard labour required of them, while those who were too weak to work had to rely on the already crammed workhouses. Furthermore, the cost of this was to be paid for by the local poor law unions, creating a vicious cycle. On top of this, the 1846 crop was an almost total failure. Black 47 was on the way. All over Ireland, workhouses filled up quickly. In November 1846, four of Kerry's five workhouses were full. The only one which was not was Carsevine, but it only opened the previous month, and within a few weeks it too would be full. Despite the rigid conditions, for many there was no alternative. Nonetheless, Many were turned away as there was no space for them in the local workhouse. In effect, they were left to die. Workhouses began to use sheds or to rent other buildings to accommodate more people. In Carsevine, 
The workhouse was built to accommodate 400 people. It was expanded to 1,200. This resulted in financial troubles, as the cost of running workhouses jumped. Since this was supposed to be paid by the local population, the poor rate had to rise too, with the poorest areas being hit the worst. Some poor law unions resisted raising rates, but the government intervened in them. This form of government intervention was allowed. At the end of December 1847, for example, the board of Carcevine was dissolved and replaced by paid guardians for failing to strike a rate, as well as other problems. Soup kitchens sprang up in many parts of the country. One, run by the Quakers in Valencia, was feeding 620 people a day. As the situation worsened, the government also brought in soup kitchens to allow some outdoor relief. However, half of the cost of this was to come from the local areas. Ireland was to pay for its famine, as many in England wanted. The Irish Poor Law was also amended. The London government was allowed to intervene in boards of guardians, resulting in 39 of them being dismissed. Basically, for not collecting poor rates with enough zeal. This included those of both Carsevine and Ken Mayer. However, the most drastic aspect of this amendment was a so-called Gregory or Quarter Acre Clause, which prevented anyone who had a quarter acre of land, 0.10 of a hectare, from getting outdoor relief. This meant thousands of people surrendered their land to their landlords to get some relief, otherwise they would have starved. The policy of making Ireland pay for the famine also act as an incentive for landlords to get rid of tenants. If we had less tenants, they would have less poor rates to pay. Policy, based on a blind belief in the market, thus worsened the impact of the famine in many ways. Alongside the tens of thousands who died of starvation, another vicious killer appeared, disease. Typhus and other types of fever, dysentery, smallpox, cholera, and other diseases were rampant, responsible for many tens of thousands of deaths, if not hundreds of thousands. Workhouses, which also functioned as hospitals, were simply not able to cope with this. Some, as in Kenmare, began to assist people to emigrate. This would be an expedient used by many. During the famine, probably around a million Irish emigrated to England, the US, Australia and elsewhere. It is worth mentioning the question of food exports. In many popular accounts of the famine, or in online discussions, it is repeated that during the famine, if it hadn't been for the export of food, there would have been more than enough food in Ireland to feed the population. This is a simplistic picture, one that overlooks the massive social inequality in Irish society. Even in the best of years, the poorest groups or classes would rarely have eaten meat or fish. They depended on the potato. Apart from little milk and oats, potatoes were the diet of the poor in Ireland. Yes, food was exported during the famine. However, grain exports declined, and from 1847 onward, Ireland was a net importer of grain. In terms of livestock, these exports probably increased during the famine. However, it should also be noted that for both livestock and grain, official figures are somewhat dubious. Moreover, there's an interesting academic debate in this area. The government could certainly have taken stronger measures to restrict food exports. Though the ideology of the free market and free trade was too strong for this to have been done properly. Moreover, halting food exports would not have been enough to feed Ireland. As Cormac O'Groda points out, the sheer gap left by the loss of potato harvest was too huge to fill. On the eve of the famine, the potato harvest was 12 to 15 million tonnes annually, half of which was used for human consumption. In comparison, 430,000 tonnes of grain were exported in 1846 and 1847. Livestock and other foodstuffs existed, but again, the gap caused by the loss of potato would have been impossible to make up without some sort of radical economic transformation. Not to be expected in 19th century capitalist Britain. In 1847, the potato harvest improved a little, but in 1848 and 1849 it worsened again. After that, the blight tapered off, and by 1852 the famine had ended. 
its impact had been horrendous, radically transforming Irish society. Around 1.2 million had died and another million emigrated. The old pre-capitalist forms of land occupation had been swept away, while the Irish language was seriously undermined, declining rapidly over the following years. Other changes would emerge over the coming decades. Importantly, debts and emigration were not evenly spread throughout the country, but were more concentrated in the poor areas. Based on official statistics, Kerry's population declined between 1841 and 1851 by 19%, though Everett's fell by only 13%. However, these figures are very unreliable, and the real losses were probably higher. Finally, the difficult question of who or what is to blame for the famine can be turned to. First, the claim that it is a result of too much government intervention and not enough free market can be discounted. This is essentially a fairy tale in bad taste. The claim of genocide can also be discounted as exaggeration, as the famine was not something the British government set out to create. However, this does not exempt the British government from responsibility. Far from it. Especially after Russell came to power, British policy was blinded by a belief in the market, compounded by anti-Irish prejudice and providentialism. Efforts were made to tackle the crisis. However, these were drastically undermined by a determination that Ireland should pay for the famine. The Irish poor still starved, fell ill and suffered. And died. The famine was caused by the blight. But this was magnified by a profoundly unequal society in which a large proportion of the population had no other option than to rely on the potato to survive. Moreover, this was tied to the emergence of capitalism in England and to the rise of Britain as an economic superpower. Ireland had been under the English crown since the 12th century and had been ruled directly from London since 1801. Yet it remained a poor and peripheral country as noted by Alexis de Tocqueville in the 1830s. Irish poverty and economic underdevelopment were thus tied to British development. British government bears responsibility for the long-term development of Ireland, or the lack of this. More directly, its blind fate in the market, linked with prejudice against the Catholic Irish and the poor, aggravated the famine. This is a sad echo in contemporary politics, and it is depressing to see people condemning England for genocide, but supporting the same type of politics, being opposed to government intervention, anti-welfare, blind belief in the market, etc. Cahersavine Workhouse is now a ruin. It's a peaceful and tranquil place. More than this, it is a symbol of a policy which failed miserably. But at the time of its greatest tests during the famine, but also during the rest of the 19th century. Nonetheless, it's a place worth visiting, for reflection, to get an idea of the complexities of the famine, and to see what simplistic answers to difficult problems can cause. <laughs>